my work, which I've done for a long time, was not pursued in order to gain the praise I now enjoy, but chiefly from a craving after knowledge, which I notice resides in me more than most other men. Today's episode of History Obscura has been presented by Podgo. Podgo is the easiest way for you and me to monetize our podcasts. Providing podcasters with a flat rate for ad space so we always know how much we're going to get when we include an ad from Podgo. Apply today to become a member and immediately be connected with advertisers that fit your audience. That's podgo.co at p-o-d-g-o dot c-o. Tell them History Obscura sent you. <coughs> Good night, and welcome to the History Obscura reading room. Tonight the Lycoi have been busy digging up some very interesting historical records from 17th century Holland. It seems that, once upon a time, in the late 1600s, scientists working with glass lenses began to see results. Magnifying lenses were immensely useful enabling short-sighted people the ability to see the world around them much more clearly. The magnifying lens was a new era for people who would otherwise have been housebound or unemployable. But of course the advent of the lens also had a significant impact on the ongoing scientific revolution. For Antony van Leeuwenhoek, magnification was something of an obsession. Lenses with very powerful magnification were used in the first microscopes during his lifetime. It was an opportunity to examine the rings and fine grains of wood. Leeuwenhoek used his microscope on anything he could find, indoors or out, and soon made a groundbreaking discovery. There were tiny living creatures on the surfaces of many of the objects he put under his lens. In recounting how he'd found such creatures living in a drop of water from his own well, Leeuwenhoek described the tiny beings as little animals, or animalcules. He remarked, This was for me, among all marvels that I have discovered in nature, the most marvelous of all. Those little animalcules were microorganisms. It was the latter part of the 17th century, and Leeuwenhoek was fascinated by the little creatures he found running and swimming on nearly everything. An examination of water revealed clusters of little eels. He remarked that there were probably a thousand organisms swimming around in just one drop of water. The scientist was delighted to discover an entire world of tiny animals and he drew figures of the ones he could see most clearly, including what were later determined to be protozoa. Of some of the little organisms, the scientist speculated that though he could not determine how they propelled themselves about the world, they may have sets of tiny paws. In 1676, the Dutch lens hobbyist made his groundbreaking discoveries and wrote a letter describing them to the Royal Society of London. Robert Hooke, chief experimenter at the Society, took it upon himself to repeat the experiments and see whether Leeuwenhoek's claims could be true. The duplicate experiment worked, and in 1680, Leeuwenhoek was given membership to the Society. He probably only visited London once in 1668, but he kept up a regular correspondence with the Royal Society after his initiation into the group. Though at first Leeuwenhoek was only a scientist in his free time, 
the discoverer of microorganisms delved deeper and deeper into the natural sciences like botany and anatomy, spending more of his time composing scientific articles than work. His discoveries were always relayed to the Royal Society, who published them on his behalf in their journal, Philosophical Transactions. Liu and Hawk's letters on the topic of microscopy shed light on the scientist's journey of discovery. He wrote, I have oft times been besought by diverse gentlemen to set down on paper what I have beheld through my newly invented microscopia, but I have generally declined. First, because I have no style or pen wherewith to express my thoughts properly. Secondly, because I have not been brought up to languages or arts, but only to business. And in the third place, because I do not gladly suffer contradiction or censure from others. This resolve of mine, however, I have now set aside at the entreaty of Dr. Reg de Graff. In the year 1675, about halfway through September, I discovered living creatures in rain, which had stood but a few days in a plain tub painted blue within. This observation provoked me to investigate this water more narrowly, and especially because these little animals were, to my eye, more than 10,000 times smaller than the animalcule which Swammerdam has portrayed and called by the name Water Flea, which you can see alive and moving in water with the bare eye. Of the first sort that I discovered in the said water, I saw, after diverse observations, that the bodies consisted of five, six, seven, or eight very clear globules, but without being able to discern any membrane or skin that held these globules together, or in which they were enclosed. When these animalcules bestirred themselves, they sometimes stuck out two little horns, which were continually moved after the fashion of a horse's ears. The part between these little horns was flat, their body else being roundish, save only that it ran somewhat to a point at the hind end, and which pointed end it had a tail, near four times as long as the whole body and looking as thick, when viewed through my microscope, as a spider's web. At the end of this tail, there was a pellet of the bigness of one of the globules of the body, and this tail I could not perceive to be used by them for their movements in very clear water. These little animals were the most wretched creatures that I have ever seen, for when, with the pellet, they did but hit on any particles or little filaments, they stuck entangled in them, and then pulled their body out into an oval and did struggle by strongly stretching themselves to get their tail loose, whereby their whole body then sprang back towards the pellet of the tail, and their tails then coiled up serpent-wise after the fashion of a copper or iron wire, this motion of stretching out and pulling together the tail continued, and I have seen several hundred animalcules caught fast by one another in a few filaments, lying within the compass of a coarse grain of sand. I also discovered a second sort of animalcules, whose figure was an oval, and I imagined that their head was placed at the pointed end. These were a little bigger than the animalcules first mentioned. Their belly is flat, provided with diverse, incredibly thin little feet, or little legs, which were moved very nimbly, and which I was able to discover only after sundry great efforts, and wherewith they brought off incredibly quick motions. The upper part of their body was round, and furnished inside with eight, ten, or twelve globules, otherwise these animalcules were very clear. These little animals would change their body into a perfect round, 
but mostly when they came to lie high and dry. Their body was also very yielding, for if they so much as brushed against a tiny filament, their body bent in, which bend also presently sprang out again, just as if you stuck your finger into a bladder full of water, and then, on removing the finger, the in-pitting went away. Yet the greatest marvel was when I brought any of the animalcules on dry place, for I then saw them change themselves at last into a round, and then the upper part of the body rose up, pyramid-like, with a point jutting out in the middle. And after having thus lain, moving with their feet for a little while, they burst asunder, and the globules and a watery humor flowed away on all sides, without my being able to discern even the least sign of any skin wherein these globules and the liquid had, to all appearance, been enclosed. This bursting asunder I figure to myself to happen thus. Imagine, for example, that you have a sheep's bladder filled with shot, peas, and water. Then, if you were to dash it to pieces on the ground, the shot, peas, and water would scatter themselves all over the place. Furthermore, I discovered a third sort of little animals that were about twice as long as broad, and to my eye quite eight times smaller than the animalcules first mentioned. And I imagined, although they were so small that I could not yet make out their little legs or fins, their motion was very quick, both roundabout and in a straight line. The fourth sort of animalcules, which I also saw a moving, were so small that for my part I can't assign any figure to them. These little animals were more than a thousand times less than the eye of a full-grown louse. For I judged the diameter of the louse's eye to be more than ten times as long as that of the said creature. And they surpassed in quickness the animalcules already spoken of. I have diverse times seen them standing still, as it were, in one spot and twirling themselves round with a swiftness such as you see in a whip top a spinning before your eye. And then again, they had a circular motion, the circumference whereof was no bigger than that of a small sand grain. And anon they would go straight ahead, or their course would be crooked. Furthermore, I also discovered sundry other sorts of little animals, but these were very big, some as large as the little mites on a rind of cheese, others bigger and very monstrous. But I intend not to specify them, and will only say that they were, for the most part, made up of such soft parts that they burst asunder whenever the water happened to run off them. In his experiments, Leeuwenhock also observed the effect that vinegar had on these multiple and diverse animalcules, which is to kill them. Thank you for listening. Please check out our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash history obscura, or check out the show links to see how to buy us a nice cup of tea. Either way, your support is very much needed and appreciated. Good night!